Thanks, everybody. Um, so uh, as, uh, as was said, uh, my name's Amy. This is uh, David Allen. We're going to talk to you a little bit about uh, bringing together table and graph data uh, in Spark and, and weaving it together. And just a really quick overview for those of you that aren't super familiar with um, property graphs and a label property graphs. Uh, very simply, you've got nodes in a graph, you've got people, cars, what you might normally think of as a noun, and these can have labels to help classify them, um, to kind of help understand what, what they are. There are relationships in graphs, and relationships are basically how do things relate together, just what it sounds like. You know, maybe this person lives with somebody else, maybe they're married with somebody else, uh, they drive or own a car, very simple kind of concept of, of relationships. And then we have a really clicking problem. Then we have um, properties on each one of those, and this is what makes it a property graph model. So you might have uh, a person, but what's their name? How tall are they? When were they born? When did they move somewhere? Where do they live? Uh, and then for a car, you know, what's the brand? Um, what model was it made? And so this kind of gives you attributes to both your nodes and your relationships, and you can store, um, store them together. And then you can have, of course, indexes as well. So that's just a really high level um, overview of a property graph. Um, just a curiosity, how many people in here are already familiar with graphs or use them? Oh, love it, great, fantastic. So you're probably already familiar with that. And you're also probably already familiar with the idea that graphs are really coming into their own. You've probably seen um, announcements, you've probably played with them yourself, and you kind of understand that as our information is becoming more interconnected, the, um, the value of those connections and how they relate together is also growing. And that can be anything from social, it can be business processes. Um, we have people that, uh, that look at how things are related for recommendations, for cybersecurity, all different types of use cases. What we're here to talk to you today is about a new product called Neo4j Morpheus. Um, many of you will probably recognize the movie source for that name. Um, but Morpheus is a hybrid workbench or a workplace that weaves together both table and graph data in Spark so you can do your in-memory analysis and wrangling of that data. And We've, as I mentioned, you've probably seen some of these announcements of Neo4j is a very popular graph database, but we're not the only one out there. We're not the only graph technology vendor out there. Um, you probably know that there's you know, some graph functionality on top of SQL. Um, there's been announcements um, from AWS Na uh, Neptune. Um, there's Cosmos DB and Microsoft. So graph databases, property graph databases, are really um, rising in use, um, especially the last couple of years, and have really come into their own. And then, of course, you guys are all here. Spark, probably one of the most popular scale-out tools out there, or platforms out there for compute. And it really made sense, as we were talking to our customers, to kind of bring these things together and to give you a graph lens that spans across multiple sources. And so you can look at your different sources. Maybe it's graph, maybe it's um, tabular in HDFS, maybe it's, um, uh, maybe it's a document within side of a table. And look at that and bring that data together without having to reformat or move your data. And you can do that with these flexible integrations that we'll talk a little bit about in a few minutes here. And what that means is you don't have to reformat, you don't model, you don't have to move, you can leave your data where it is and bring your analysis to that data. And what it's actually doing is it's lifting this information up into, into um, data frames within Spark and then giving you some really powerful pattern matching. In particular, if people are familiar with the Cypher graph query language that Neo4j uses, it gives you some very powerful tools to look at the data in there. You can do things like um, having look at multiple graphs. You can do a query that spans multiple graph sources, multiple da data types. You can look at a uh, query across table and graph data. Um, and then, of course, you can do the things you'd want to do, like do subgraphs, do filtering, um, do joins between different graph data. And you can do this with a single abstraction model when you lift that data up. And it also lets you do things like hop between different summarizations. So you can have multiple views of a single graph. And so for an example of that might be, I want to look at my data uh, over a week, or maybe I want to look at the data as it's summarized by a month or 12 months, 
and kind of hop between those different views. The other thing that we'll talk a little bit about in a few minutes is progressive graph analysis. And you can think of that as composable queries. So your output graph can become your input for your next query, can become your input for your next query. So at every step of the way, you're adding more value to your data, again, without touching that original source information. Um, and one of the things that I think David's going to talk a little bit about is a very common use case, 360 uh, customer views that um, a lot of people are quite interested in. Sure. So go for it. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? All right. Uh, my name is David Allen. So Amy talked a little bit about the high-level overview of what the product is. We're talking about Morpheus and dealing with graphs inside of Spark. Why would you want to do a thing like that? Um, a very common scenario that we run into is this need for 360 degree analysis of customers. Let's take, for example, an insurance company. These companies get very big and they tend to grow by acquisition over time. And so underneath the covers, they tend to not have one database, but actually 15 with different versions of facts about customers in different parts of the company. So in, in the case of an insurance company, they're going to have policy data, product information and customer data, claim history and demographics. So one of the uses that we see for Morpheus is to take each of these underlying sources as if it is its own distinct graph and to integrate them all into one big single graph that takes all of the claim and the product information together. You then use that graph as an input to find a particular customer and you'll know that within one system, no one system is going to contain the full record of this customer, but after integrating, you can, and you can do additional operations that you need, such as filtering people out, whatever the case of your analytic is going to be. Um, now, once you've got this big graph inside of your Spark environment, um, what you have is a graph that can be persisted in a number of different ways. Under the covers within Spark, it's still just a data frame, so you can put it into a Parquet file, or you can do uh, put it into a Hive Meta store, or being that it is a graph, you can persist it back to Neo4j. We find that a lot of folks are going to be persisting these graphs into Neo4j specifically so they can exploit the extra tooling that's in the native graph database that we're, that we're usually known for. So within the scope of Neo4j, we've got the graph algorithms package, and we have Neo4j Bloom, which is a visualization engine that lets non-technical users explore that data. So the, the, the overall use case here, though, is to get a single unified picture of a customer's behavior across the entire company by integrating a bunch of these graphs, taking the result, putting that into Neo4j, and then using that as the basis for further analysis. Um, finally, in Neo4j, once you find those influential customers, and once you've exploited the graph algorithms however you need, um, you can then save your target result set back. And the, the end part of this loop is just basically looking at Neo4j as yet another source that you can pull into your Spark environment. So if you have existing graphs that you're already taking care of, those can be transformed into data frames and then exploited easily with all of the existing Spark tooling that you've got in addition to being usable as graphs. Okay. And I'll just, I'll just quickly say, maybe I won't. Yeah, I'll quickly say that I think this is a really nice recognition that um, different platforms have specialized uses or uses that it's, they're particularly good for. And, and in the Spark environment, um, we had customers that really needed to do um, more data wrangling with different sources cut down their information, filter out what they needed, and then they wanted to go to a native graph database to do like um, online transaction processing, have acid storage, things like that. So, so what I really like about this product is it kind of marries, starts to marry the analytics and the transactional world and make it easier to go between the two. And I think that, that example actually is a really good one for that. So we're going to be getting to code in just a second. Another important element of this is transparency. So when we say that we're making something into a graph, it's not fundamentally destroying the information that you already have or creating a new data set. It's rather just applying a graph lens to it. And so when you're dealing with graphs in Spark, you want to also be able to look at them as graph frames if that's more convenient for your given use. So uh, let's talk a little bit about how this works at a technical level, and then I'm going to get into two short demos where I'll show you some code examples and we'll be more concrete about how this works. Um, so in your Spark environment, where you're running Morpheus, you have these various sources at the bottom. The first layer at the bottom 
is what we call the graph catalog and mapping. So the mapping element of this is where you do the transformation from a data frame into a graph. You'll see a concrete example in a moment. The graph catalog is sort of like a specialized in-memory cache for, um, um, for, for Spark that allows you to keep a, keep a graph in memory rather than materializing it. Um, at the very top, you have a component called Cypher for Apache Spark. That's where you're actually performing the global graph operations. And so when you write a Cypher query, this is going to be, in the end, um, transpiled down to C uh, uh, Spark SQL operations. So um, that's where you're actually writing your queries and running your analyses. Um, that then consists of these three elements, general operations, Cypher query elements, and SQL query elements. Um, I, a thing I maybe mentioned, forgot to mention before is at the very bottom, you can use an external JDBC source as a data source here. Um, so SQL query elements, in some case, to populate your data frame, you're actually going to be pushing down a query to a different database entirely. And then, yes, in the middle, there's this global graph cache. And so this is not too dissimilar from what you're already used to. Um, operating in a Spark environment where you basically want to create a situation where you have a bunch of different graphs under different namespaced names, all cached in, with whatever caching policy is, is appropriate for your use. So let's, let's take a look at how this works. Okay, um, I'm going to start with some really simple examples to kind of give you uh, a, a taste of how you would do this in the simplest case. And we can talk about a multiple graph example and kind of go from there. So here I have, oops. Can everybody see that or is that a little larger? Can you make that a little larger? Sure. Yeah. Uh, it, it is much cooler when you can see it. Yeah, let me see if I can increase the resolution. I probably don't want to do it that way. I'm forgetting the key binding for this. Control plus plus is what it should be. Yeah. Let's do this a command shift plus. Nope, that's not it. I'm going to do this a different way, maybe. Sorry, guys, just a moment here. Command Shift Plus is not it. <laughs> Tool Windows. So another use case. Uh, I don't know if you guys. Oh, so, uh, Yay. OK. De demo. Yeah. Sorry. OK. So we're going to start off with the simplest possible way. We're, let's, make, let's make some data frames. So. Here, I've got some technologies. All that's in this data frame is an ID column and a text label. And I'm going to create a second data frame of groups. So right here, I've given it a key and a name. Then I'm going to create groups, which is web development scripting and systems programming. Again, just an ID and a name. And then we're going to create two data frames right there. Now, this is all entirely vanilla, vanilla Spark stuff. Finally, we're going to create a relationship table where the relationships themselves have an ID. And then the two extra columns are basically like a source and a target of the nodes that those relationships are linking. And so if you've ever done graphs in a relational database before, this is like a really typical standard way to do that. So then I'm going to create a mapping. And so the mapping is basically how we tell Morpheus how this data frame turns into a node in the graph. And in, in, th in this case, it's really simple. Uh, there's a source ID key, which is a field called ID. We mean that this data frame is going to end up being a node labeled tech. And we mean that um, it ends up with the property name uh, of name in addition to ID. So categories is basically the same thing again. We're just creating a different kind of node in our graph. Finally, to make relationships in the graph, the relationships themselves have to have IDs, and they have to have a start node key and an end node key and a relationship type. That's provided by this mapping. 
Um, we then turn those into caps node and caps relationship tables, and then just do session dot read from uh, graph, and we have a graph in memory. We talked a little bit a moment ago about the graph store, and there it is right there. So this is going to temporarily cache that and under the name text, so that when we write a multiple graph query um, in Cypher, we're going to be able to refer to everything that we just did there just as text. And as the simplest possible query, um, we're, we're just going to do this right here, which is from graph sessions.txt match some node that is a technology linked to a category via a category relationship and return the name and the, and the technology type order by c.name. Like this is a really simple cipher query just to kind of show the, the um, and of course now I need to get out of presentation mode, um, exit presentation mode. And at the bottom, I lost my run window. This is a really short one, so it should run pretty quickly. Ah. There we go. Um, this may be hard for you to see given the, the, the text size, but basically we have a set of um, category names and technologies in that corresponding exactly to what we did in the data frames, but via graph query. So that's the simple example. Um, in most corporate environments, each of those individual graphs are going to represent some sort of a snapshot of an underlying system of record, and it's going to get really complicated really quickly. So I wanted to show you one more demo to kind of give you the, the knit together aspect of this. So here we have a social network um, that we are reading out of our session and storing as a graph called social network. We also have a set of, in this case, CSV files um, that we're going to register as a separate graph called csv.products. And so in some separate step, we have done the transformation and the cleansing, anything that's necessary, and we've got these two graphs possibly stored in different locations. And what we're then going to do is run this query right here. I need to blow this up into presentation mode. OK, much better. <clears throat> so using the from graph um, uh, clause here, we're going to take just the people from the social network. And from the products graph, we're going to take just the customers. And we're going to join them on where the name of the person equals the customer name. And then we're going to construct a new graph um, using those two as input again and then creating a new novel edge that did not exist in any of the original underlying graphs. And finally, the result of that, we're going to get that as a graph. We're not going to take it as a tabular set of results. So we now have this recommendation graph because we know, um, who, uh, you know which records from these two systems correspond to one another. We're then going to try to use that as the basis for a recommendation and say, well, the way we would make a recommendation for this person is say, if person A is a friend of person B, that's this part right here, and person B is a customer, and the customer has previously bought a certain product, then we will use those products as recommendations for customer A by using the social network data that we have about them, and then show the resulting uh, recommendations. So this is just kind of hopefully a, a quick run through and demo to give you the ideas that A, you want to take data frames, create mappings to them, turn them into graphs. B, use those graphs to be stored in or, or sourced from any of the different underlying options, whether that's JDBC, whether that's Neo4j, whether it's Hive, Parquet, whatever. And then finally, once you have a series of graphs, you can use Cypher again to knit those together and then result in yet another graph, which allows for pipelining of queries. So once you have a graph, if you can run Cypher on a graph, you can continue that process as many times as you need for your pipeline. Okay. Amy, you want to take it? Yeah, sure. Um, I think we have a few minutes, so I'm actually going to show them the uh, tables for labels stuff. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so you, you want me to talk about this? Uh, 
Sure, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Um, so the, the, this mapping, so the fundamental problem that you have to address is the difference between the relational physical model and, and what graphs are doing. And so the way to understand how this mapping works is really simple if you've got the tables for labels concept. So in a Neo4j graph or in a property graph, you have a label for every different kind of node, like a person, all right? And tables for labels is exactly what it sounds like. For every kind of node in the graph, you're gonna have a particular data frame. And that da the only requirements on that data frame is that it must have a unique ID and then any set of properties that, that you care about, okay? With relationships, it's again the same. In the property graph model, relationships can have their own properties, but you don't have to have them. So a minimal relation ta relationship table is a unique ID for the relationship, and then a from ID and a to ID that matches up with what's in your other data frame. If you have that, you're golden. You can have any number of other attributes that you might want there. That's kind of the tables for labels concept. And then when you go into the Morpheus API and you look at how to write the Scala code, it falls out really simply um, from there. Anything you want to add? Uh, no, I, I'll just do a quick walkthrough of how that how that works. So you know, it's it's pretty simple as far as the the tables for labels you know magic here. It's it's really quite flexible because you're going to read in um, your tables, look at the labels, try to extract your categories, your your join data, um, and then you're going to assign um, tables to every label set, and you'll end up with some some fat tables, and then relationships to joins and and try to understand any constraints you might have. Um, then it will actually uh, help you map your data to a schema because you need a schema, obviously, in Spark, and create some SQL views. Uh, then from that, you know, there's some human elements because no uh, mapping is ever perfect, where you actually needed to kind of go through and make adjustments. And there, from and from there, you actually um, create your your ERD uh, that can then be spawned off into a property graph or back to a relational. Um, so really flexible model, makes a lot of things um, much easier so you can kind of abstract without reformatting. And so with that, we'll start, we'll get ready for some questions here. Um, while we're um, getting ready for questions, I will say that um, we are in, uh, sorry, this picture is for David because it makes him laugh. Um, but, uh, and there's a story behind it, so come down to the booth and I'll tell you a story. But uh, we are doing early adopters. Uh, GA is planned for fall this year. Um, but we are talking to people that want to uh, start kicking the tires now. Uh, you can talk to your account rep, uh, come downstairs, find us in the booth, or get a hold of either uh, David or myself. So with that, um, any questions? Did it make sense? Does this make logical sense why we would be doing this, kind of reaching out? Okay, we've got some questions. Go ahead. Um, the, the, yeah. the, first, the first GA is going to be Scala only, but we yeah. are going to have a uh, PySpark implementation. Okay, and I think I saw another question. Great, yeah. Yes. Nope, no, shout louder. No, no, just shout at us, we'll hear you. Okay, well, uh, you're issuing... I think it's on now. You're issuing, okay, you're issuing Cypher. Uh, are you pulling the data in memory in Neo4j or does the data stay in Spark? Uh, depends on how you do it. So when you're using Cypher on Morpheus, basically under the covers, these are operations that get translated into Spark SQL and so like the Catalyst optimizer comes into play and Neo4j is nowhere in the picture, okay? Um, now, if you take a graph and you form it in Spark and then you choose to persist it to Neo4j, then obviously what you do there is gonna be a separate set of considerations. You can run then, in that case, Cypher on either Neo4j or on Morpheus. So there are certain kinds of graph algorithms that don't lend themselves well to parallelization and implementation in terms of Spark. And so for some of those, like it's very difficult to parallelize a breadth first search, for example, right? Um, so in those cases, you're gonna probably wanna do that on Neo4j um, but uh, you have the option to do it either way. Yes? Hi. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, are there any plans to add integration with any other kind of uh, graph database other than Neo4j? Um, anyone in particular you have in mind? Uh, Janus Graph, for example? Janus Graph, uh huh. Um, let's see. I, I don't think that we have integrations with others of those planned. However, I mean, arguably, like, it, it, 
as I've been saying, it's data frames under the covers. And uh, I think an argument can be made that there are a whole existing set of tools there that are already applicable in this case. I see. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining. Come downstairs Thanks, and talk to us. Great. Thank you. Thank you.